Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. In our last video we talked about how the Acolyte and how her master will attempt to destroy the Jedi Order. So after doing a bit of research, especially in Legends lore, I've actually started connecting some dots and I feel like I actually know what they're trying to do with the story here. And it's very interesting. You see, the Acolyte story might be loosely based on several legend stories and prophecies that are neatly bunched together into one package. And so I see the Acolyte, despite all the controversy surrounding it, as kind of like a hybrid of that. This is a new era, but a lot of the ideas here actually do come from legends, uh, for better or worse. Now, this is going to be a pretty crazy theory. I'm going to be tying a lot of things together, and I'm going to be bringing back a lot of the things I've been talking about in my last few videos. So just stick with me here. Okay, so May's dark side master understands to destroy the Jedi Order, he cannot confront them with force. Just like how Mon Motha understood that the Rebellion could never defeat the Empire through conventional warfare. The Jedi, like the Empire, is an institution during this time period. It is strong and all powerful. But like all ruling parties and organizations, it gets its right to rule from the people. Shake the people's belief in the Jedi and their foundation, their institution will crumble, just like what happened with the Galactic Empire. I kind of like the tone in the Acolytes. This is a story where simply being the good guy organization will not guarantee success. And, you know, simply being the evil organization does not mean you are doomed to fail. And this is kind of realistic because in the grand struggle of power in real life, there are only really winners and losers. And since the dark side, the Sith, we're not sure if these guys are Sith, have been waiting and hiding in the shadows for so long, they get to strike first. This entire series, as Hedlund mentions, is designed in a way to explain how the prequel era Jedi became so blind to Darth Sidious. Now, May's dark side master is focused on exposing a horrific crime the Jedi committed many years earlier when May and her twin sister Osha were still children. The identical twins were born in a tribe of Force-sensitive witches. Now, one of the major uh, story plot points that kind of escaped my attention until I read one of your comments is that May and Osha's parents are actually two women, two witches, so they have two mothers. This kind of makes sense. That now I understand why you know some of the more sensitive individuals in the fandom were triggered by this. But guys, you know, if you're an actual Star Wars fan, a sci-fi fan, objectively speaking, having two mothers is a relatively mild thing in the genre. I mean, if you get triggered by stuff like this, wait till you find out about the Hutt's reproduction cycle and their ability to change sex in order to bear children. I mean, granted they wrote that lore in the 90s and we didn't have social media back then. There were snowflakes all over the place, but they just weren't given like megaphones to amplify their, you know, their complaints, I guess. But what will be interesting is what the in-universe explanation for May and Osha's birth will be. They can go in a lot of different directions here. From my understanding, usually forced cults, um, small covens like this group of witches on Brendock, they usually are able to preserve some ancient force techniques because they've stayed out of the uh, Jedi and Sith wars. I mean, the Jedi and Sith conflicts had terrible consequences on knowledge about the force. While the Sith were too busy causing chaos and destroying everything, the Jedi were running around being super afraid of all types of Force techniques and basically banning everything. And so the only place where many ancient Force techniques were preserved and allowed to be learned were in smaller factions, like the Death Mary Knight Sisters. I'm sure the uh, Witch Covenant on Brendock also had their own specific practices that we'll learn more about. And I think it's very possible, this might be crazy, that Osha and May were created somehow by using the Force, because usually two women can't have kids unless they have a, 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 a sperm donor or some kind, which is also another possibility, of course. Now, this could have been detected by the Jedi Order, who could have seen this as a perverse use of the Force or something like that. The Jedi were always very dogmatic on how one should use the Force. A lot of techniques like Force Alchemy were just straight up banned because they were seen as too powerful and, um, you know, basically they didn't want to corrupt the nature of the Force by using it in this way. But in all fairness, the Jedi have interacted with various Force cults and organizations, including the Death of Mary Night Sisters throughout history. And even though they might not share the same views of the Force as these other organizations, they mostly let them be unless they prove to be a larger threat to the galaxy. Like the Sith. I mean, with the Sith, the Jedi are not open-minded. They will, you know, kill Sith babies if necessary, you know, to prevent them from taking root and power. Now, whatever happened on Brendock, I do think is very serious. Something that might have threatened the Jedi so much that they were able to do very heinous things. I think, you know, Master Torben's apology to May and insistence that he thought he was doing the right thing before he guzzles some poison points towards this direction. I'm pretty sure that the Jedi were somehow involved in this great fire and disaster. They might have even said it trying to kill someone there. Perhaps they were even trying to murder May and Osha. Hence the apology to May 
from Torben. Which means that the uh, force users on Brendock weren't just practicing some unorthodox policies. I think that they were involved in something even greater, something that the Jedi might have known. Maybe they were involved in a prophecy of some sort that the Jedi were trying to prevent, specifically a Sith prophecy of the Dyad. Now, the doctrine of the Dyad was more or less created in the sequel era, and therefore there's a lot of negative connotations surrounding it, but the concept of the doctrine of the Dyad is very much already explored in Legends by Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis. It actually isn't as stupid as people think. Well, it's no dumber than the Chosen One prophecy, you know, all prophecies are kind of wonky, right? So it turns out one of the main reasons why Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis wanted to subvert the Rule of Two was because of what they saw as a greater prophecy, the doctrine of the Dyad. For a millennium, the Sith have adhered to the Rule of Two. But this decree is said to merely be a pale imitation of its predecessor, the Doctrine of the Diet. Legends claim that two beings sharing this profound connection gain access to a great number of abilities, skills beyond the grasp of even the most powerful Force wielder. So this idea of the Force Diet actually builds on the legendary story of Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis, one of my you know favorite novels in probably the uh, entire backlog. And so... Again, this happens a lot in the Disney era. We're seeing the convergence of legends and canon material. Sometimes it's not done well. I mean, Dave Filoni is criticized a lot for doing this and not really honoring the source material. But I, I actually feel like the transition from Darth Plagueis' um, relationship with Darth Sidious to the Force Dyad makes a lot of sense. So for those of you familiar with the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise, he was the immune Sith Lord who mentored Palpatine and took him on as an apprentice. Darth Plagueis didn't want to adhere to the rule of two because he was quite a logical and dispassionate Sith. This made him extremely dangerous and, and efficient at whatever he was trying to do. He also saw that the rule of two was just pretty stupid. I mean, the whole concept revolved around a Sith master teaching everything they know to an apprentice so that they could defeat them. Um, that goes against a, uh, any sentient beings like survival instincts. It doesn't really make sense. And so what you oftentimes have is Sith masters trying to do something at the last moment to prevent knowledge flung to the apprentice or some other kind of crazy incident that could basically threaten the entire rule of two, um, kind of lineage. Also, putting the entire survival of the Sith Order in the hands of just two individuals at one time seems very dangerous, especially if one of those individuals turns against the Sith, like legendary Sith Lord Darth Gravid. He basically started merging Jedi teachings with Sith teachings, he started going mad, and then he tried to destroy all the Sith teachings that he, you know, that many generations of Sith had collected. And he basically set the Sith Order back like several hundred years. Darth Plagueis was a rational being, and he was under no illusion that he would be willing to go quietly as his apprentice murders him and takes over his life work. But he also understood that he needed an apprentice. He needed someone else to help him with his life work. And his life work was trying to see just how far he could go with manipulating the Force. The Force was the building block of all life in the galaxy, so why couldn't he, for instance, say, create life from the Force itself? This was kind of seen as a perversion of the Force by the Jedi and by the Cosmic Force in some ways, but with Darth Sidious helping him, he was able to achieve some pretty crazy things. One of his end goals was to reanimate a recently deceased body by forcing the midichlorians in the body from deserting it. He obviously also had to keep the organs and the brain and everything alive, you know, with oxygen and blood. But yeah, when the midichlorians leave the body, apparently that's when the soul, the consciousness leaves as well. Plagueis was actually able to teach Darth Sidious this technique, and together they were able to reanimate one of Darth Plagueis' other apprentices. The idea was for Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious to both use this technique on each other and keep each other alive until the end of the time so that they can explore the Force more and basically figure out everything. In a lot of ways, I believe what Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious was trying to do is very similar to the Doctrine of the Diet, which by the way, predates the Rule of Two now in canon. The Doctrine of the Diet states that there will be a pair of Force users one day so connected together in the Force that they become one in the Force. These two are able to unlock immense powers that have never been seen before. This gives the Force Diet the ability to communicate with each other no matter how great the distance. It also allows them to transfer objects and powers instantaneously from one another. They could also borrow or give each other life force to supplement their power or even revive one another from death. The new canon explanation for the Rule of Two is that the Rule of Two was actually created to force a Force Diet. 
into happening. I think in a lot of ways this actually makes the rule of two more rational because again, this is a risky and stupid thing for the Sith to do and it completely goes against their very selfish nature. But if there is this promise that a force diet style connection can grant the user's unlimited power, then it would make sense that every rule of two era Sith Lord was basically trying to create a force diet with their apprentice because it was believed that the force diet would unlock the full potential of the dark side. Now eventually Kylo Ren and Rey would emerge as the force diet that everyone was looking for and Palpatine would try to use that connection to heal himself. This seems to indicate that force diets cannot be created and the Sith were wrong in assuming so. The Force Diet seemed to happen naturally. So anyway, the Jedi Archives, like the library in Hogwarts, has a huge collection of Holocron's records about various prophecies, including many Sith prophecies. The Force Diet is very likely one of those Holocrons seized by the Jedi in their numerous conflicts with the Dark Side. I think it's very possible that the Jedi became aware of this concept of the Doctrine of the Diet. Once Osha and Mei were born, maybe they felt this shift in the Force and started seeking out these two individuals. You know, the Jedi of this period were very dogmatic and fearful of the Sith, even though they hadn't seen them in hundreds of years, I think the appearance of a Force Dyad, or at least the belief that a Force Dyad had been created, is strong enough of a reason for the Jedi to commit heinous actions. I mean, they've done this in the past. As I mentioned before, the four Jedi on Brendok really do remind me of the Jedi Masters of the Terrace Tower who carried out the Padawan Massacre during the Old Republic era. Now, in previous videos, I didn't really explain what exactly happened, so I'll, I'll go into detail a little bit more so you can see the similarities between this tale and what's happening in the Acolyte. Basically, while having a joint meditation session, these Jedi known as the Covenant envision a future where the Jedi Temple is destroyed and great suffering engulfs the galaxy and they all perish. The culprit of all of this is one of their Padawans. Therefore, the Jedi Masters of the Terrace Tower of this Covenant decide to kill all of their Padawan, but one Padawan, Zayn Carrick, would witness this incident and flee. Now, the Jedi Covenant would blame the deaths of these Padawans on Zayn. It was a very convenient way for them to cover up their own shady dealings, but the Jedi Order, which was based on Dantooine at the time, um, were unhappy that the Covenant were unable to capture Zayn, and so they recalled them from Terrace, because, um, you know, at the time, you couldn't just cover up the death of so many Padawans, that would be in the news, there was a lot of controversy, the Jedi of the period also had enemies in the Senate, mirroring, uh, this mirrors exactly what the Jedi Masters are talking about in the Acolytes. Now, when the Covenant left the Tower on Terrace, this actually had an enormous consequence on geopolitics in the galaxy. You see, at the time, the Mandalorian Neo Crusaders were pillaging the Outer Rim territories. There have been voices in the Republic and the Jedi Order launch attack against these Mandalorians who were just, you know, killing everyone. But since most of these Outer Rim territories that were getting raided were not member states or not economically or politically important, the Republic, as usual, did nothing. They also didn't have much of a standing military at the time. This might sound familiar to you guys. It sounds a lot like the Golden Age of the Republic period. Now, Terrace was a Eusebianopolis world. For those of you who played Kotar, you might remember it as one of the first worlds you visit. It's a vibrant city, a mini coruscant in the Outer Rim, with layers upon layers of city to explore. Terrace was one of the only Eusebianopolises in the Outer Rim, and this made it quite a powerful planet. And although the Mandalorian Crusaders uh, pillaged the nearby systems and plants, they didn't dare touch Terrace until the Covenant were forced to leave their tower there. When they left the tower, the Mandalorians would launch an all-out attack on Terrace, and this would force the Old Republic military finally to enter the conflict, which would eventually start the Mandalorian Wars. This is the war where Revan joins the conflict with a faction of younger Jedi Knights, and they all go rogue and fall to the dark side. The Mandalorians would get defeated, but then Revan and most of his fleet would disappear into the Unknown Region, and then he would return many years later at the head of a Sith fleet, and this would cascade into several more conflicts in the next few hundred, if not thousands, of years. I mean, basically because of this one vision the Jedi had, this one heinous action they committed because of fear, it, it created a series of events that snowballed into larger and larger conflicts. This would eventually lead to the sacking of Coruscant and the Jedi Temple, and the near destruction of the Jedi Order and all of its members. And actually, every member of the Covenant who, you know, participated in the Padawan Massacre, they would all die very painful, and uh, horrible deaths during the conflict, as the prophecy predicted. I believe that what Lucasfilm is trying to do here with the Acolyte is very similar. The Jedi of Brendok have 
clearly done something terrible that could destroy the image of the Order should the information get out. May's assassination of these two Jedi already is already drawing attention to the Jedi Order and perhaps the events on Brendok. The Jedi are clearly trying to cover up this incident and it goes all the way to the top to, uh, you know, Jedi Master Rowe. And I think this is going to lead to some really fundamental shifts with the Golden Age Jedi. I think it's going to change them for the worse and in a lot of ways, this is going to leave them in the state that we see them in the prequels when the Clone Wars starts. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, the democracy. I'll see you next time.